Okay, uh, welcome to the geospatial data community of practice session. Um, today we are going to have a very special webinar uh, from uh, two invited speakers, uh, Esther Rolf from University of California, Berkeley, and, and Tama Carlton from University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, we were looking for some really fresh and radical new ideas on how we use remote sensing in agriculture and uh, natural resource management that a lot of PGIR colleagues are doing. Uh, and then we came across uh, their presentation from AGU conference last year. And yeah, as you will hear, it, it, it's really different and it's really exciting also. Uh, so we wanted to learn uh, how their system work and what they found and how we might also learn and apply in our agricultural domain. So we are really excited to hear from uh, Esther and Tama. So hope you enjoy this webinar. And yeah, af after the webinar, um, so they will also show us a little bit of how the system work on their computer environment. And then we will have a chance to have a Q&A and more in-depth discussion. So yeah, I will ask Esther to uh, take it from here. Hi everyone, my name is Esther and I'm here with my co-author Tama. And today we're gonna to be telling you about global scale observation using satellite imagery and machine learning. Uh, so through the talk, I'll first give kind of an overview of our work, and then Tama will show you a demo of what uh, using Mosaics, our system, looks like from a user perspective. Uh, first, I thought it would be uh, fun to give you a little bit of perspective on our team and how this project came about. So I'm a fifth year student in the computer science department at Berkeley which is usually in normal times housed in Soda Hall, this building that you see on the left. And when this project started, uh, Tama and a bunch of our other collaborators were housed in the School of Public Policy, which you can see is actually just across the street. So as a computer scientist, I was really excited about collaborating with kind of a different set of researchers than usual so that in developing the machine learning algorithms that basically my PhD revolves around, uh, it was really with the intent of someone who wanted to use these systems for predictions at the end of the day. And I was sitting over here uh, on the right of your screen at the public policy school um, doing my PhD and as an applied economist working um, at the intersection of environment and development economics, we um, were sort of watching the remote sensing revolution from afar, kind of hoping that the predictions that we need to do our research would be generated from the remote sensing and machine learning communities. So it was so exciting about coming together with Esther and her colleagues was that we could co-create um, the types of data that we needed to answer our research questions um, alongside the tool development with um, the computer science department. So the remote sensing revolution that I'm referring to, I'm sure many of you are familiar, is just this massive amount of data that's being collected through satellites um, currently orbiting the Earth. Right now we're estimating that it's over 90 terabytes of data being collected every single day. And as we've been able to see, this has allowed researchers to generate estimates of variables that allow us to monitor our world in a way we've never been able to do before. So here you're seeing a few examples. We've got measures of deforestation at high resolution globally. There are different groups that have measured crop yields from space in certain regions of the world. And increasingly, we're even getting estimates of aggregate socioeconomic well-being metrics like poverty and consumption um, in regions of the world like Sub-Saharan Africa, where that's a very costly thing to do on the ground. And so while this is really exciting, what we were seeing from our perspective and many of our colleagues as applied social scientists is that transforming satellite imagery into those metrics I just showed you is really costly and it leaves a lot of people out. So this is expensive for a couple different reasons. First, you need massive computational resources to get yourself from a satellite image to an estimate of poverty or crop yields in a given location. But you also need a certain type of expertise. So as economists, for example, we didn't necessarily have the training to work with that si size of data or with remote sensing or machine learning tools to actually get us to the levels of the predictions that we needed to do our research. So what that left us with is a set of um, projects like you saw on the previous slide, where one group gives us estimates of poverty, another group gives us estimates of crop yields. But what happens when I, as a researcher, want to answer a new question in a new place, and I don't have the means of estimating that, um, that particular variable in that context? 
So our approach as a team and coming together across computer science and uh, economics and public policy is to create a general method that will allow researchers like myself and my colleagues to predict any new variable from space in any new context without incurring those computational or expertise costs. And so Esther is now going to walk you through what this general method does and give you a, a sense of what it means, um, hopefully, for democratizing access to these tools for people um, like myself and other applied researchers, like hopefully many of you. Great. Thanks, Tamla, for setting the stage here. Uh, so how do we go about operationalizing this goal of generality and usability for kind of different sorts of researchers? Well, here you see a, kind of an overview of the Mosaics pipeline, so the system that we've built. Uh, and I'll go through this piece by piece. So first, we're starting with a set of geolocated images. And kind of the core um, algorithmic contribution here is translating each of these images that carries a lot of data in these pixel values into uh, k-dimensional vectors that carry information that can then be used for prediction. So each of these images is um, now constituting a row of this matrix. So we're transforming pixel values into uh, scalar values in these vectors. And to perform a prediction, uh, let's say we have values of forest cover in some locations. Well, we match those forest cover observations with the feature vectors corresponding the images of those locations. And from these pairings, we can learn regression weights beta here that describe the relationship between these vectors and the forest cover values. Then for all these locations, these question marks, where we don't actually have ground truth data about the forest cover in those regions, well, we still have these vectors because we still have imagery covering those regions. And we have this mapping beta that we've learned from where we did have labels. And we can use that to predict all of these regions uh, where we didn't already have data and kind of scale out these maps. And here you see worldwide predictions of forest cover, as well as this inset of predictions uh, compared to the ground truth forest covers. And so what's really nice about this system, and you can kind of see it in this diagram, the exact same process that one researcher goes through to predict forest cover is the process that a different researcher might go through to predict, say, population density. It's the same feature embedding that's getting used, the same form of a linear regression here, and uh, scaling this out. So I want to go a bit into what this regression process looks like. Well, once you have the feature matrix here, you want to merge it with a set of labels that you care about, and then you're performing uh, you are just running a linear regression here. So this is a ridge regression. It's just like ordinary least squares um, plus a penalization for model complexity. Uh, but the really important thing in this diagram is all of the arrows are pointing toward the optimization problem. So what this means is you can create this feature matrix in advance and store it and then whatever set of labels you want to pair to predict, uh, you can use that same feature matrix. In contrast with convolutional neural networks, which are kind of the popular tool of choice in computer vision and machine learning right now, you're not only optimizing over these regression parameters, you're also optimizing over model weights in the network itself. So the first thing to notice here is we have this backwards arrow. So all of a sudden, we can't have that process of knowing the future ahead of knowing the labels, we actually have to have the labels to train this entire model and get those features back out. What this means is you get a more expressive model so you can learn more complicated functional forms with the CNN than our approach, but you're also now optimizing over more variables so it's going to take longer to train a method like this. Uh, so when we put these two methods head to head, here you see the performance uh, so R squared is an accuracy metric, so you're looking at up here is better, of R system mosaics, which are these left bars, versus a fine-tuned ResNet 18, so a CNN like what I showed on the previous slide, are the middle bars here, and we're evaluating over seven different tasks. So all of these different colors are different variables that pr we're predicting. And what we notice here is we're getting pretty comparable performance 
between our method and the fine-tuned ResNet 18. Uh, but when we look at this along the dimension of how long it takes to train these models, it becomes apparent that Mosaics is much, much faster. So each of these bars for Mosaics takes about seven minutes to train and evaluate, and that's on a computer with uh, just a CPU and full cross-validation over all of the model parameters. For each of these ResNet 18 performance bars, that takes about seven hours to compute. And this is on an Amazon Web Services cloud uh, computing device with a pretty hefty GPU. It requires a GPU. And we're being a little conservative in our timing estimate here because this is just for one hyperparameter setting. So if you wanted to really train these models yourself, you'd have to also do a search over different hyperparameter settings. And that would take um, even more time. And so why might we think that kind of a simpler method can get achieve, can achieve comparable performance for kind of a fraction of this computational cost? If we look at what CNNs were really, um, where they rose to uh, their claim to fame here, it's really on classification of natural imagery. So think like images you can take from a handheld camera. So these are two images from a very famous benchmark data set in machine learning called ImageNet. And there the task is from this image, predict what's inside the image. So a good classifier on ImageNet would learn that both of these contain a red panda. So these classifiers need to be able to tell that even the panda from the left where this image is taken kind of above and at this wide angle, as well as this image on the right where you see just this close up of the panda's face, both of those are the same object. Uh, whereas when we look at satellite images like the ones below, they're largely scale and orientation invariant. So like one kilometer of road in the image on the left and one kilometer of road in the image on the right are very related. And it's these structures in the satellite imagery that can help explain why performance of simpler methods could still match that of more complex methods. So kind of with this context, I'll go a little bit more in detail of what our predictions and performance looks like. So here you see uh, ground truth data for forest cover across the US on the left. You see our model's predictions on the right. And then on the very right, you see a scatter plot of our predictions on the horizontal axis versus the true labels on the vertical axis. I'll also show um, the results for predicting population density, as well as per household income. And we predict four more variables, and I put them all on this one slide to show you kind of the value of having a common featureization and solve process that we can start to compare performance across tasks and ask questions like, which of these variables can we predict from space with high fidelity? Uh, and where are we not able to resolve all of the label complexity with our predictions? We also predict globally where the labels are available. So here's global predictions of forest cover on the right versus the labels on the left. Uh, population density. Nighttime light. So this is predicting nighttime luminosity from daytime satellite images and elevation. Uh, and I'd like to just pause and say a lot of analyses would end here in producing maps and validating them with holdout set accuracy. All of the accuracies I've showed you so far are on a holdout set separate from the training data. But what we're really excited about is that this fixed featureization allows us to test these predictions even further and really look at their use in practice. So let me explain what I mean here with an example. Say we want to assess whether our method is actually generalizing over space. Are we learning what properties of the satellite image correspond to high population density, high housing prices, or are we just kind of learning locality? Are we learning this is a house in California, so prices should be high? So what we'll do to test this is we'll split the US up into geographically disjoint training and validation sets. So I think everything in these yellow cells is constituting the training set that the model is learned on. And then everything in the blue set, we hold out and we use for evaluating the model. Uh, this is very similar to a spatial cross-validation approach, if that's familiar. So what we'll do is we'll change the size of these cells. We'll vary their width delta. 
And uh, so as we're making delta bigger, we're actually making the learning problem harder because we're evaluating performance on data, set, data points that are further from anything that we've trained on. And so as we increase delta, we're asking at what distance is, are we going to get to before performance really starts degrading. So as we vary delta from left to right in these plots, we see that the accuracy is decreasing at larger delta as we expected. For some outcomes like forest cover, population density, and nighttime lights, that degradation is pretty gradual, whereas for others, it's more steep. Um, and I'd note kind of down here in the lower right, delta equals 16 is actually pretty big spatial chunks that we're um, splitting the US into. So when we compare this to a spatial interpolation baseline, where we're not using images at all to predict, but this baseline in gray just says, take a local average of all of the training points in those training checkers and use that for prediction. So we're outperforming that baseline on five of seven tasks, which is good news because we're actually using the satellite information to uh, up prediction accuracy. And kind of the one glaring uh, task where we're not outperforming is elevation. And if you kind of think of how elevation changes over space, it's geographically constrained to be continuous. Um, so that's not a huge surprise. Um, and housing prices, well, we know to be highly spatially correlated. Uh, but the real takeaway is from this experiment is that this is just one example of one sensitivity check that you might want to run in practice if you're going to use these output predictions as part of another process of research. Uh, so in particular, there's a lot of settings where you have your ground truth data in one specific location and you want to use the satellite imagery and machine learning to kind of fill in the rest of the map. That's a huge motivation for this type of technology. Well, you need to know kind of how far in space can I predict before those predictions are invalid because I'm predicting in a place that just looks too different from where my training data was. Uh, another point here is that we can do these types of um, diagnostic tests very quickly. So each of these data points here, uh, remember, takes about seven minutes to compute. And across seven tasks, across all of these different values of delta, we're actually computing uh, four different numbers for each of these points so that we get this notion of spread. That's seven minutes for each of those versus if you wanted to use a CNN for this type of analysis, it's gonna be roughly seven hours for each of those. So you can see this starts to add up really, really quickly when you need to kind of reassess what these predictions mean in your context. So, Going back really quickly to our overarching pipeline and goal here, uh, it's very important to us that we are passing off this technology to kind of the users of our, of our research at the level of these features um, so that the users can run regressions, run these type of tests that you can develop in the context where it matters to you. And this is very different than just providing kind of a map. Um, and we're hoping that it's much richer and it helps different type of scientists engage with this research. Uh, so in order to do that, we're developing a public user interface where researchers can query for the features they need and run their own scientific analyses. So on the back end, we're working with an image provider to translate satellite images into feature vectors. And then from a researcher's point of view, as long as you have kind of a geo-referenced uh, list of variables here, all you need to do is upload a CSV of latitude and longitude to our website. We will, on the back end, compute the features for those locations, and we'll send those features back to you. And then you just need to merge that with your original data set. And so I should say the website itself is kind of in the works. Um, but the, the process itself works where kind of you replace this gray mosaics website box with my email address. So you can send me a CSV of latitude and longitude. I will run the computations on a machine in the basement of Soda Hall, which you saw in the very beginning of the talk. And then I will email you back a link to how you can download these features. Um, so that's to say, if you are really excited about using mosaics, if you have kind of 
the right labeled data pre-ready to go, let's just get started. Or if you have an interesting problem where it's not quite clear yet how that fits into the framework I've talked about here and you'd like to talk further about that, uh, reach out to us. So my email is here and uh, Tama's email is here and we'd love to hear from you. Um, so we'll have a longer time for questions at the end, uh, but for now Tama is going to give a demo of what this process looks like once you get those features back. Okay, so the idea here is um, to be able to give you a little bit of a window into what it might look like if you either followed that process when we have that public interface up and running or just emailed Esther and got some features back. And here I want to show you really how simple it is. So we're actually going to sit here and run cell by cell through an example Python notebook and we're going to wait for the processes to run. We're going to see exactly how long um, this thing takes to give you really a flavor of what it looks like to actually do this. So there's basically three steps are so pretty simple. First, we're gonna start by just merging the ground truth data that you might have with the corresponding mosaics features where that merge is happening on location so that the ground truth data is matched to the imagery corresponding to that location. The second step is really the heart of this process. We're gonna train a prediction model that is going to, um, in our case, be ridge regression with k-fold cross validation. You could innovate a lot on this second step and perform any type of um, prediction model that you would like. Ridge regression is uh, relatively simple and easy to execute, and we'll walk through what that looks like here. And as we've shown you, it performs quite well across tasks. And then finally, you want to be able to look at your uh, performance. How well am I doing? And we'll show you a couple different ways of how to look at your performance. So first step we're going to run through, very simple. We're just doing a merge. So first I'm going to load, um, I'm going to load some uh, packages here we've built some packages that we're going to share with users that make some of these things easier but nothing that i'm doing uh, can't be done with standard canned python packages and then the second cell we're going to look at task specific settings so this is where you might be um, needing to adjust some things if you were in a new context that looked different the task we're going to do here is population density so this is where i'm um, indicating my task and the outcome name here is log population. That's important because if I look at my label data, I actually see that population density across space is quite log normally distributed. And so the outcome I'm actually going to predict is the log of population density given the distribution of my data. That's something that you would know from being familiar with the label data in your context. I'm gonna um, indicate that the features I want are the mosaics features. There's a randomized component to them, which is why this is called um, random. In theory, if you really wanted to innovate here, you could um, throw mosaics up against some other features that you that you have. But here, I'm just going to show you what it looks like for mosaics features. Um, I'm just going to grab the file paths from my computer where these things are located. And then here, you're going to use a couple different um, inputs that you need to train the model for your particular setting. So um, as we mentioned before, we're running ridge regression, which is basically OLS with a penalization parameter. I'm going to send this uh, ridge regression a vector of possible um, penalization parameters, and we're going to use cross-validation to optimally uh, to pick the best one. And that's what this vector is here. And then you may want to clip your prediction. So for example, when we're studying population density, you don't want your model to be able to predict negative population. That's not a feasible outcome. And so you can play around with um, forcing the, the model to predict um, uh, within a certain set of bounds. And that's what I'm indicating here. Okay, so now that we've got our settings set up, um, now we just want to conduct this merge. Again, we're merging based on spatial features. I'm going to um, force you all to sit here and wait while this um, loads, just to give you a sense of, you know, we're still working with pretty big data. So I'm going to be loading this X matrix, which means a vector of 8,000 features for each one of my locations in my data set. That is a lot smaller than if you actually had to touch the imagery yourself and work with these satellite images, but it's still relatively large and we've got to wait for it to load. So what this means is that we've loaded our training data and um, the locations of each of the, sorry, loaded our feature data and each of the latitude and longitude locations that correspond to those features. What I'm going to do now is merge those X's with my labeled data Y. I'm additionally going to split my data set into a train and test set. As is um, largely conventional, we're gonna take 80% of our data and we're gonna train this model on it. We're gonna keep 20% untouched so that at the end of the day, we can go back and test our performance in that untouched data. Um, so what we've done so far is we've loaded our features and our labeled data along with the latitude and longitudes that they correspond to. Let's take a look at what these actually 
um, look like. So for our X matrix of features, this just looks like tabular data that we should all be pretty familiar with working with. Each row is a different location. And here you're seeing the first three features in this data set. Um, so these are the first three features in this 8,000 vector, uh, 8,000 um, dimensional feature matrix, and you have each one um, for a given location. Of course, our labeled data are just one observation for each location. This is the, pop the log of the population density for each of our locations. And then our la latitude and longitudes are um, where we're merging. We have our lat and long coordinates for each one of these locations. So that's just the merge. And now we want to be able to actually generate our predictions. So I'm gonna let this run and then talk you through what it's doing. So again, we're using ridge regression, um, but we are going to use five-fold cross-validation to optimally pick that hyperparameter. So what you're seeing, what we're waiting on here is each one of our five folds um, where we are pulling one of our lambda values using five-fold cross-validation to pick, uh, to generate out of sample performance, and then ultimately we'll choose the one that performs best. Um, so I think this should take us about a minute and a half on the computer that I'm using. Again, going back to Esther's um, slide deck, if we were training a CNN, what's really important here is that when I'm running this ridge regression, this X data set is just being fed into a linear regression a bunch of different times. There's nothing about this process that requires me to go back to the images and redefine what this X matrix is. It stays fixed every time and it would stay fixed if Esther jumped on and wanted to do forest cover, whereas here I'm doing population density. So here you can see we've trained on three out of the five, uh, four out of the five um, folds so far. Um, and again, I think it should be done in about a minute and a half. Right, and so this notebook, kind of a much more commented version of this notebook, uh, so that you can follow along without Tama giving you all of this awesome information, uh, will be available when we release the code for this project. Yeah, so again, a lot of these things are, um, are canned functions that you can do in Python, but the idea is that not only would we give you the features um, and sort of instruction manual, this would be a notebook that you could um, hopefully just swap out some things within these different cells and, and generate your own predictions. Okay, so it looks like we've trained our model. Um, we're gonna store the predictions from that model and, um, and metrics like R2. And then now we wanna actually see, you know, I just ran a bunch of regressions. You guys want to know that it actually worked. So here's just a couple of different ways to look at performance. First one is sort of standard, which Esther showed you. I'm just going to I'm just going to plot a scatter plot of the actual um, observed values of population density from across the U.S. against our predictions, and you can see our overall R2 performance is 0.73. But there's some interesting structure here, right? Like we're doing pretty well, but our predictions generally are underestimating population density at those really high population uh, regions of the country. And that's really helpful for us to know and potentially innovate on if we have ideas for how to improve it. Um, of course, most of the, the problems that we're interested in here are very spatial in nature. So we want to be able to see spatially where we're doing well, where we might not be, and if we're capturing in general the spatial pattern of our labels. And so what you're seeing on the left is the spatial scatter of our observations, our ground truth data, and on the right, our predictions. Overall, we're really capturing the spatial characteristics across um, the US, but you can even see, um, as an example, you know, um, the under prediction of really, really high population uh, regions on the East Coast, as you would guess from the scatter above. And so this is um, sort of some easy diagnostics to see how your, your model is working. Um, so that's the full demo. That should be how long it would take you to go from A to Z with your own um, set, of, uh, set of labels. And um, we would be happy to answer questions at this point. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, let's start from the first question from Ani. Um, so yeah, Ani is asking to elaborate a little bit more on the feature vector, which is output of the featureization. Uh, it's quite technical. I hope you can understand what he's asking. Right. Yeah. Right, so the featureization process itself yeah. is kind of motivated from a theoretical machine learning algorithm that's based in um, kernel methods. You have also asked about um, kind of the correlation between the different variables that we predict. Uh, so we look at kind of the um, correlations of the variables themselves that we're predicting, as well as we look at the correlation of the regression weights that we learn for 
uh, each of these variables. And we do seem to be picking up on kind of different structural aspects of the um, prediction task here. That's not in the um, slide deck, but I'd be happy to kind of share more information with you about that if you shoot me an email. You've also asked, it looks like, about um, kind of what this would look like for a more complex program problem like multi-class classification or yield prediction. Uh, and there's some recent work from other groups there showing that kind of um, even simpler models, so they're looking at kind of simplifying the neural nets themselves, uh, can have actually advantageous gains in prediction of those more complicated tasks. So I'd ha be happy to share that kind of stuff with you as well. Again, just shoot me an email. Just a quick follow-up, I just um, shared with everyone a figure showing the correlation across our outcomes. And um, for some outcomes, like income and nightlights, there's high correlation. That's been well documented. But for most of these outcomes, we actually see there's quite um, minimal correlation across all of them. But you can see that visually in the figure. OK, this is great. We can do two things at once. Um, yeah, the next question came from Ulrike. Um, so Ulrike, and actually, I, I'm, I'm working the same kind of project or product, uh, it's called SPAM. Uh, so we are trying to estimate global crop production at 10 kilometer resolution uh, for 42 different crops. And yeah, if, if um, yeah, so uh, we were wondering if this method will be helpful for us to spatially disaggregate statistics data. So the input data on our side is kind of subnational unit like county level statistics data. And we have some ideas on how cropland, uh, where crops are grown. Um, and we wanted to kind of uh, disaggregate statistics data into that pixel level. And yeah, we were wondering if this method can be helpful. Yeah, that's a great application case. Um, so you can actually imagine training your model at the scale of the subnational units for which you have labeled data. So you have coarser resolution labeled data, but we could train a model at that resolution and then use the fact that the imagery are available at much higher resolution to then generate the predictions at that higher resolution. Um, we've actually demonstrated this going even farther that you can go to the pixel level level of prediction within the image. Um, but for you, even going to the scale of one image would be much higher resolution than the labeled data that you have. Um, and we'd be happy to talk offline. Of course, you'd want to generate some um, checks and sensitivity analysis to understand how well you're performing at higher resolution, given that you don't have labeled data at higher resolution to check performance against. So we'd want to be creative and thinking about how to feel confident about those predictions. Um, but that's exactly um, a perfect use case of, of this type of method. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, OK, so Kai is asking. Oh, OK, so he's asking about, like, say, oil palm disease. So actually, a lot of our colleagues are working on kind of plant disease and crop uh, pest detection using remote sensing or, or trying to estimate the area where this disease outbreak might happen in the future, for example. Um, so do you think that kind of application could be um, yeah, maybe useful for using this method. Great. So everything that we showed you today uses kind of just the red, green, blue channels of the imagery. Um, but there's nothing kind of fundamental about the method that prevents us from using uh, more spectral bands for the analysis. Mm. Um, so like NDVI there. Um, it's more just the images that we were working with there that constrained us to look at red, green, blue. So this definitely could be used um, to look at things like crop health. Uh, one thing to note is if you're looking at kind of indicators of crop health that you can see kind of from a satellite scale, that's, that's a good case to be in. If it's something where you're looking at kind of the leaves of the plant to see like, is there disease here? Um, there might be more to it than looking at uh, top-down satellite images. So you might want to look at a hybrid approach that couples kind of what you can see from space with what you can see on the ground with like more natural imagery type camera pictures of the plant. Um, I'm not an expert on oil palm disease, so I'm not sure uh, which of those is more suitable, but there's kind of a whole host of different techniques that can be combined. Yeah, and, and in case it's not 
clear when we um, say combined, we're actually running a linear regression to train that model. So there's nothing stopping you from adding on the right hand side, the features that we give you with any other predictor variables that you have from other data sources. So it's really easy to combine this method um, with other types of, um, of sensors or control variables that you've collected with a ground survey, for example. Right. And Kai seems to be indicating in the chat here that we can align all of these different observations to the same locations, which is like really all you need. Yep. Excellent. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, I also had just a question uh, we may just edit out later. <laughs> so, uh, so is there a way to incorporate some kind of temporal time series dimension into this? Um, I think a lot of kind of uh, features that we are dealing in agriculture is kind of auto-correlated over time when it was cropland, it will be probably cropland uh, next year, it was probably cropland different uh, the previous year. And is there something we can bring that temporal information into this process? Right, so you could definitely add that in at this step of kind of the, the regression procedure. So you could see, use the same featureization process on mm -hmm. images from this year, last year, next year, and then say, as you're doing this prediction, you want to kind of enforce that if my prediction this year is this is cropland, it's more likely that last year and next year will also be cropland. So that's like definitely a doable thing. Okay. Uh, yeah, so thanks a lot. Uh, maybe just uh, before we close, uh, what, what's your plan? Uh, I, I heard you're going to make this notebook public and share with everyone. So what's kind of yeah, what's coming up from you? Right, yeah, so the paper that uh, summarizes all of this work and actually gives a lot more detail than what I gave today um, is currently in submission. And then as soon as that paper is kind of uh, finds its landing point, all of the code to do what Tama did in her demonstration, as well as all of the code to reproduce all of the experiments in our paper, uh, will be publicly available. Uh, you'll be able to access it as long as, as well as all of this um, technical material. I mean, again, I, I, I can't hide my excitement. <laughs> I, I can't wait to just get my hands on to do something. Um, yeah. Like Esther said, um, you know, do email us if before that web interface is up and running, there's right. exciting problems um, because we're, we're already collaborating with some other groups and it's really okay. exciting to see the way that people are excited to use these tools right now. Okay, great, excellent. Yeah, so thank you very much for the presentation and making it available. Um, yeah, and continue working with us. Uh, maybe, yeah, you're willing really to work with us to collaborate together. Do you have any question to ask? Uh, so all of these colleagues are joining today and also will be joining live uh, later in the convention are working in agriculture uh, from all around the world. Uh, probably different types of colleagues that you are working together, uh, collaborating so far. So if you have any questions, you can also ask. Um, I don't have any questions, but a big thank you to all of you for attending, listening, and asking questions. Yeah. This has been great. Okay, great. Likewise, thank you. Okay, thank you very much.